Good evening. That was good, right? <laughs> Tonight we're going to talk about trauma patient assessment. As EMTs, you'll be expected to assess every single student, every single patient that you come across. To me, there's not much difference between students and patients, so it's okay. They know the same medical stuff. So, you will be expected to assess every patient that you come across. Now, not everybody is lucky enough to be in my class. There are other EMTs and medics who go to other instructors and other classes, right? How are you going to work with an EMT who you have never seen before, didn't go to the same EMT school as you, or went to the same EMT school but had a different instructor? How's that going to work? How are you going to work together on the scene? Therefore, it has been established that there is a specific order of doing things and a correct way of doing things. And we will be learning, according to New York State, how they want you to assess every single patient. We've spoken before that there are two subgroups of patients. There are trauma patients. That means any patient who has gotten hurt, right? The definition of trauma is somebody that some outside force has acted upon the body, that will make them a trauma patient. And the other category, which we will not deal with tonight, but we will deal with soon, will be medical patients. These are patients that have gone sick, for whatever reason. Tonight we're going to focus on trauma patients. Now, let's define what we're actually going to be talking about. Because a trauma can be a patient who trips on the chair and stubs their toe. That's a trauma, okay? It's also the person who loses body parts secondary to a stabbing, a fight, an MVA, etc., etc. When we talk about trauma patients from now till the end of the course, we're talking about the most serious forms of trauma, whether they are knocked over by a vehicle, whether they are rejected from a vehicle, whether they have a high fall, or many, many other mechanisms that each one of you could think of, motorcycles, etc. Doesn't matter. When we talk now, from now till the end of the course, about trauma, we're not referring to a little cut from the challah knife, okay, that needs to be washed, bacitracin, and a band-aid, okay? We're not talking about that. However, if you decide to work EMS, 911, or, or volunteer, you will be called for these calls, okay? All the same rules apply, except you're dealing with it at the lowest, lowest end of the scale. When I lecture, when we talk about trauma, when we do our trauma skills, we'll always be dealing with a serious mechanism of injury, MOI. Make sure it's very clear. So, we need a way that everybody in New York State will assess the patient the same way. Alright, doesn't matter where you are. You, like I tell you, as soon as you graduate, you can go to Rochester, to Ithaca, Utica, it doesn't matter. You can go to any street in Crown Heights, and you can be an EMT. Alright? It doesn't matter, because your card is good, and you're a New York State EMT. However, you've got to be able to perform the assessment the same way as somebody that went to school in Buffalo. Okay? And that's what this is all about. You will be tested on this, there will be a state exam just on performing the trauma patient assessment. We will do these on skill nights. However, tonight, the goal is to learn the theory behind it and to get a concept, an idea of what it's all about and what the order needs to be. I will skip certain slides um, and I will pick those up later when we do the dark blue book. Okay, so certain things I will only address a little bit later. All right, here we go. 
trauma patient assessment. So these are the things that you will need to do. All right, all these things, uh, and we're going to go into each and every one. We're going to discuss them. We're going to understand all the different parts that are involved in this trauma patient assessment. So we start off with the scene size up. Scene size up. We're always going to start with our two favorite things, BSI and scene safety. All right. Or as we've said before, if you do BSI and then scene safety, that means if you get blown to smithereens by a bomb, at least you had gloves on. Right? <laughs> really, it's scene safety and then BSI. So we need to just keep that in mind. All right, MOI, we've done this before, right? We've spoken about it. It's the mechanism of injury. What, what happened? When I walk in, when I look at a scene, what happened? It's not always obvious. Sometimes it is, but it's not always. What happened? What is my MOI? How many patients? I can't express to you how important this is and how many times EMS has made a mess out of this one, okay? How many patients? It's such an easy question. When you get to an MVA, motor vehicle accident, multiple cars are involved, how many people were in this car, how many people were in this car, make sure somebody has accounted for every single person. Before you start. Before you start. Yeah. I need to know how many patients there are. Um, I think you mentioned last time that an MCI, is there are more patients? Than resources. Not, isn't there, if there's more than three people, I think I just five. said. Five, I have five. They told me five. I didn't give you a number. No, but you can have, if you have 10 EMTs and three patients sign an MCI. Right. No, but you can't sign the test. Right. How many patients do you have? On state exam, when they test you on this, you must ask this question. Is this my only patient? And it will be. However, you still got to ask it. You've got to know. Additional resources. Are additional resources necessary? Well, don't limit yourself to any one group of additional resources, okay? The most common additional resources are more BLS, more EMTs, okay? Next, you may want ALS. ALS if there's a particularly unstable patient, but you may not know this at this time. However, the state wants you to consider this early on. Obviously, if you have a, a seven-passenger van with another five-passenger sedan, right? I got over 10 patients here, potentially. Do I need more resources? First thing I need is ambulances, EMTs, BLS, stuff like that. Do I need ALS? I don't know yet. I didn't check anybody. All I know is that we've got this many patients. So think about that. What other resources could, may I need? Well, if you're in the middle of the street and the cars are still flying by, I think you need PD there, quickly. Okay, your job isn't really to do traffic control. And if you end up doing traffic control, you're in the wrong profession, okay? <laughs> Not your job. So, yes, you may have to do it momentarily, or there's a way to put your ambulance to divert traffic from the accident. Um, what else? Well, you may need the electric company, the gas company, you may need the MTA. The list is endless, all right? We do not deal with electrical wiring and sparks and, you know, even if that's your job, when you're in an ambulance, you're there as an EMT, don't deal with that. Get Con Edison down here, get the electric company, etc. Spinal stabilization, we now have a different name for it. Um, I don't think I did that lecture with you yet because we were always a little behind the clock. I need to do that lecture. Um, I think it's right at the end of your lecture notes. Uh, we now have a new name. We don't really call it spinal stabilization. We call it spinal motion restriction. 
SMR. I have a lecture on it. I will discuss it with you. So that's PRN as needed. And we'll get to it. Okay, this is in bright yellow. And uh, if you were unable to notice that, then you should highlight it. Uh, this is always a test question, so I've highlighted it for you, all right? For those of you that have color copies, okay? Uh, primary assessment is to do what? Locate and treat life-threatening injuries. Very good, some of you can read. <laughs> Locate and treat life-threatening injuries. Do not forget this, this is not a joke. This is a test question. Why do we do the primary assessment? To locate and treat life-threatening injuries. Notice locate and treat. Okay, so there are going to be things that we may locate and not treat, but there are going to be things that we locate and treat. But first locate. Yeah. Okay, that is your primary assessment. Okay, in the old days it was called the initial assessment. I use both. Uh, inter you know, I interchange them. It's the same thing, primary and initial. Uh, the state has now moved to the word primary. What would be an example of a life-threatening injury that you would locate and not, not, not treat? No, no, no. If it's life-threatening, you've got to locate and treat. There are many injuries that you will locate and not treat. We'll get to that. General impression of the patient, okay? Now, I may not go, I may not need all of these. General impression means when I show up and I look at the patient, what do I see? First thing I want to say is, is it male or female? Or is it unknown, okay? Because you can't ask them usually how they're identifying today. So it's usually we're just going to go based on what they look like, male or female. Anatomical, what? Anatomy is all we care about. Uh, all we care about. Right. Um, what position are they found? Right. We know all different names of different positions. Are they prone? Right. Sucking on the concrete. Are they supine? Are they lateral? How are they found? Maybe they're sitting. Maybe they're standing. Doesn't matter. Let me know. How do they look? Okay, how do they look? They look fine? Okay, do they have a piece of anatomy hanging off or hanging out or, you know, does it look like they're talking, are their eyes open when we walk over to them? How do they look, right? Simple. An approximate age. Now age, you can never say that the patient, this time, that the patient is 32 and a half, okay? This is an approximate age. I wanna know what group they fit into. Are they a toddler, are they a child, are they a teenager, are they in their 20s, 30s, 50s, 60s, approximate. Okay, this is not a passport age at this time. General impression, general impression. What am I dealing with? What have I got here? Okay. This is all done really quickly. Chief complaint, chief complaint. Now the definition of a chief complaint is, I ask you the question. Why did you call an ambulance today? Whatever you say, that is your chief complaint. It's not medical. It should never be translated into medicalese. It always remains what the patient says. Okay, so why did you call an ambulance today? My effing foot hurts. That's it, that's how you write it. Okay, shame I'm a foolish. For real? Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. People get into a lot of trouble. You'll beat the hell. I'm gonna put a bleep in there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm gonna bleep anyway. Oh. <laughs> Unnecessary censorship. <laughs> YouTube channel. Those are always the best. It's a great YouTube channel. If you're bored, you gotta look up. They just play a generic, non-actual, dirty language. And they just put random bleeps in. <laughs> like the president speaking, it'll be like, we finally beat those beeps. <laughs> hey, we don't want any beeps. <laughs> we want it raw and uncensored. <laughs> All right. So, um, what do they say? Now, what happens if you come over there and you say, hey, dude, why do why you call an ambulance? And they're, they're out. They're unresponsive. They're not talking to you. They got nothing to say. What do you do then? Try to wake them up. They're not saying anything. 
You tried to wake them up. What are you going to do? Hit their shoulder. Okay, you do all that and they still don't say anything. ABCs. The clocks. What's it What do you do next? ABCs, CPR. They're not no, what Check status? It. What are they in? They're what are they? Unresponsive. They're probably unresponsive, right? right? So what's their chief complaint? You don't know. They're unresponsive. They're unresponsive. That's their chief complaint. Right. Okay? Because <laughs> they're not saying anything. Alright? So their chief complaint, we will just deem as unresponsive. That's why they called an ambulance. Obviously, they didn't call. Right? Have and and collapsed after. We'll just go with that. All right. <laughs> Level of consciousness. <laughs> L. What? <laughs> yes. L O C. Level of consciousness. So L O C. You should learn this abbreviation. The problem in medicine with L O C. Some people say it means loss of consciousness. Some people say it means level of consciousness. So the question is, be, be careful with it. Okay, be careful how you use it. Usually means level of consciousness, can also mean loss of consciousness, and in the same sentence, you could use it as both. All right, so the patient's LOC is unresponsive, but he. Uh, no, the patient's LOC is alert. He uh, pay a bystander state that he had LOC. You see how I use both in the same sentence. Be careful. Make sure you are, you're understood what you mean. So we should interpret it as level or loss? Depends who you're talking about. Depends on how, how it's... Uh -huh. Depends so if it's being used as a, you know... Depends what part of the sentence is being used in and what makes sense. Um, have we done AFPU? Have I yes. done AFPU yeah. with you? Let me just run through it quickly. Alert. Thank you. For, just in case someone else doesn't know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Ask them for a friend. It's not proximal of this. It's just that. I'm very distal to knowing what this is. <laughs> okay. Sure. We'll, we'll get you there. <laughs> Avpu, listen, listen. There are four. It's very interesting. Remember, remember, I taught you um, in head injuries. Remember, I taught you about GCS. Mm -hmm. Remember how to evaluate drunken Scots people, uh, right? Yeah. 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 What's very interesting is that when I spoke to many different doctors in South Africa, um, each one, and this is many different ones, unrelated, different fields of medicine. They all said that AFPU is much better to use in EMS than GCS. I find in New York that GCS is still something that is, is looked at as, as a real uh, determination of the patient status. For example, the other day I came into a hospital, I said, this patient was initially GCS of 3, en route, GCS has now increased to 14, okay? And the nurse said, GCS of 3? Whoa, okay, and got very busy. Um, I don't think when, you know, when the BLS said that the patient was initially unresponsive and now she sees that he's talking, it didn't Registered. fire the same response in her head. That's how you would use AFPU, just by saying he was unconscious? And yeah, unconscious. yeah. Let me just run through it quickly number, again. So a number is easier to relate to than a list of symptoms. Yeah. Right. yeah but it's you know it's, it's like it's right. in a pain level. You know, they always ask, is the pain levels? Yeah, you know, it's a like, number. The problem is, the number is much easier right. to... AFPU is four, it's four letters. Yeah, so it's, GCS yeah. is anywhere from no, three to 15. If it was AFPU, KAPU, DUBU, 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 then you'd be like, oh man, it's DUBU, DUBU? Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's AFPU. Thanks for joining, Ellie. Yeah, Ellie, welcome back. <laughs> Thanks. So, so, AFPO, let's just run through it quickly. We want our patients, our best patients, to be alert, right? Alert is A. What does A mean? So if I say, what's your name, and you answer your name, and then I say, 
anything else and you can't answer it, it's no good telling me, yeah, he's alert, he's alert, he's fine, he knew his name. No, it's not good enough. Okay, remember, to be A, to get an A in school, you got to get three out of three. I had that. Three out of three. They sometimes can get one or two and not all three. I have this all the time with head, uh, head trauma patients. So ask the questions. What is your name? Or, like I told you, always better if they're with a buddy or a spouse or a friend or a partner or whatever, ask who's that? What's their name? It's the best question you can ask. Where are you right now? Okay? And what time of year is it? Okay? When it's this time of year, doesn't matter. There's always a holiday no matter what religion or faith or, you know, there's always something that someone can answer you. You can ask what um, season is it? Um, you know, again, it depends on your crowd, okay? You know, I've asked people what's today's parsha or whatever, stuff like that. If you expect them to know that answer. You can't ask somebody who you don't expect them to know the answer, right? You can't ask them that question. Don't worry enough, Tali. We won't ask them. <laughs> <laughs> we asked the guy, we asked him if it's, what's today's day. He goes, Friday. We said, no, it's Thursday. He goes, it's Thursday? No, it's Friday. He was arguing. Okay. <laughs> is that, is that That's pretty Friday? alert. That's, no, again, yeah, alert do doesn't mean yeah. Yeah. that he has the ability to argue. <laughs> alert means what? Person, place, and time. So if you use the app where you come to the hospital and say he knows his name, doesn't know what time it is? Yes, absolutely. They test different parts. Yes, they test different parts. Yes, they test different parts. They test yes, it's way short term. It's seven and three. Okay. But no, but then GCS is seven. They're going to want to know what did they lose? Where are they dropping those points? They still have to know the information on your credit card. In the NFL, they ask which team you're playing, what's the score in the game, who's winning. Yeah. They had trauma, but when they go down, they run to the field. Probably part of their... Computer. So what are they... One second. This is legit? You're yeah, saying something legit. real now? <laughs> Sorry. I thought it was, was Scooby-Doo. <laughs> legit, yeah. They say, what's the score? Who are you playing? What quarter are we in? You see? Because right, it's testing... Person, place, and time. It's the same... And they go... Uh, 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 and they're like, okay, folks. <laughs> 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 no, they give them some stuff. They just put back in the next one. We have patient. We have a story. So maybe that's the... The EMT said, okay, tell me a date. She said, November 2020. Wow. Yeah. They're really gone. All right. <laughs> to be alert, again, alert. <laughs> Guys, this is what you have to get over. It's a mistake a lot of people make. Because you're having a conversation with them, and they're spitting back all sorts of garbage, and, but it's coming out in real words, doesn't make them alert. Right. You all understand this? Yeah. That doesn't make them alert. Alert's not what you thought alert meant anymore. It's only the correct thing. You've got to answer all three correctly. Now, what are all these people, all these cases that you're giving me, where they're coming back with the wrong answers, or maybe none of the answers, that, but they're coming back with something, they're responding to your verbal stimuli, your verbal stimuli. All these put them in the verbal. verbal category. Do they have to speak to be verbal? Do they have to speak? No. No, absolutely not. You say, buddy, what's up? What's going on? And you look at me and swing your fist in my face. That is a response to... Verbal stimuli. He is V. Crazy. Well, then, it's that's a given. We're just going to go with, right? His A AFPO. Crazy isn't one of the a, ones. A is the patient responding, V is responding to your question. Well, A, they were still responding to your questions. Right, but it's them speaking. V is. No, they could speak. What's your name? Susan. Where are you? In the White House. <laughs> What day is it? 2020. I answered all your questions. Am I A? Yeah. Sounds like a normal person in the Trump administration. Good job. Thank you. All right? I answered all your questions. So it's not the way to look at it. A. They answer person, place, and time. Three out of three. Event is on one. Let's stick with three. 
You want to keep things simple? Uh, absolutely. Don't make it more complicated. <laughs> No. Okay, if, if the computer goes down, that means we spent too long on a slide. Okay, just... Point of reference. Yeah. V, again, A, I answered all three questions right. Person, place, and time. Where are you, who are you, and what time of year is it, what time... Asking the date is a no-no, so nobody ever knows the date, okay? So, not the date. Pain, my favorite, the one that, again, I keep running into this problem, EMTs don't know how to hurt people, okay? Now, when I have a class of female EMTs, they know how to do it, okay? I just tell them, you just pretend it's your guy, and he ticked you off. They know how to hurt somebody. I don't know, you get in the street, you put on a uniform, everyone's scared to hurt people, all right? New York State so wants you... Pain, that oh, I was going to tell them about their mothers, so like, right. <laughs> New York State wants you to pinch the earlobe or the soft um, flesh on the top of the shoulder. This is the back of the tricep also? Yeah. Whatever is going to hurt them. Between you and me, and we're off camera now so we can say this we just do I do a sternal rub okay the sternal rub where you take the knuckle and you go up and down the sternum can't beat it okay for some reason that hurts anybody yeah anytime for what yeah. The state isn't big into it. They sort of want you to not to do that anymore. So on your state tests, guys, on your state tests, you want to be pinching the flesh on top of the shoulder. All right? Unresponsive. Who is truly unresponsive? No. Who is truly unresponsive? A dead person. No. They're not unresponsive. They dead. They're unconscious. A true unresponsive is one who does not respond to A, V, and P. That is the only way to define unresponsiveness. Because if they're not breathing and they have no pulse, they're apneic and pulseless, then they're dead. Then being unresponsive isn't really what we care about. They're dead. Right? So, let's understand this. How can you determine unresponsiveness? No AVP. No AVP. They don't answer your questions. They don't answer anything even wrong or incorrect or try to hurt you. And when you hurt them, you don't get a grimace. You don't get a flinch. Nothing. Therefore, now our patient is unresponsive. unresponsive. I come many, many times. I get called to the unresponsive. I get over there. I hurt them. And they... <laughs> They ain't are unresponsive. <laughs> okay, question. Let's just throw this out. What's wrong with being unresponsive? What's wrong with being in the state of unresponsiveness? Is anything wrong with it? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. That's okay. Like, that's what I asked. But what, there is one thing that's bad. They can't tell you what's wrong. No. They can be... Bleeding? No. They could be sleeping, no? Shot. They could be, but what's wrong? What's the possible bad the thing? Uh, they could be having a... They could be, I don't care. I'm what is the problem with being unresponsive? There's one thing that is a problem. Everything else can be dealt with. But what's the problem right there and then that you have to fix? If they are unresponsive, find the real reason. Make sure they're breathing. You can't find the real reason. You don't have the diagnostic tools. ABC. Go on. Elaborate. Who said that? Who said ABC? So come on. I mean, elaborate. Oxygen? No, it's not the problem. Airway. Go on. Elaborate. What's airway? Talk to me. Make sure he's breathing. No, that's breathing. Oxygen. That's breathing. breathing. Airway. He's nothing's being blocked. He's okay. Elaborate. Slip, slip it could tongue? be that he's, he's, not, he's not unresponsive it's because tongue. he has a because he has slip something tongue. Stuck. When someone is unresponsive, truly, they lose muscle control. What muscle control do you absolutely need 
to keep your airway open? Tongue. tongue. If you lose muscle control, then the tongue is going to well, that, that. Block, you know there's a, there's block the airway. Clip. And if you block the airway, then your patient's going to die. Therefore, being unresponsive has one problem, and an EMT can fix that. How? In a recovery Breathing. position. Well, you could do a head tilt chin lift if there's no spine injury. Put in OPA. Spinal. Put in a recovery. OPA. OPA. Thank OPA. you. I'll put one in. Airway. I will do airway in the next uh, thing. Breathing. I will do later and circulation. I will do all these later. There is one thing over here I'd like to talk about. I want to talk about this box. Now, this is debated in medicine, if this is even true. It's something that has been spoken about for many, many years. It continues to raise its head here or there. It's, it's a, it's an estimate. Let's put it like that. Let's underline that word. And this is what it says. Again, it's highly debated if this is even factual. Okay? But this is what we always believed. If somebody has a radial pulse, okay, you can palpate a radial pulse, it means that they have at least a systolic blood pressure of 80. You understand the correlation? Mm -hmm. Means that in order to have a systolic blood pressure of at least 80, that will it has to reach that reach part. the most the most distal, distal. pulse. <laughs> the, the distal. What the heel have to do with anything? <laughs> Ooh. Very good. The most distal pulse, yeah. right? That so you would need to have a systolic of at least 80. The femoral which is in the groin, obviously is closer, right, to the aorta, not as distal, it's more what? More? Proximal. Proximal, right? So that you, only, you would, if you have a femoral pulse or a femoral pulse, you have a systolic of at least 70. And the closest pulse would be the carotids, which are where? In the neck. And if someone has a carotid pulse, that means that they have a systolic of at least 60. It's called the 60, 70, 80 rule. Um, and, you know, it's... On the test. I don't remember. <laughs> don't remember. MFHG always means systolic? The... No, no, no. That means millimeters of mercury. That's how we measure... All our pressures, when we say 120 over 80, it's all, it's all means millimeters of mercury. Hg is the chemical term for mercury. Not important, you will not be tested on it. There's no mercury anymore. In okay? Either. And there's no mercury so anymore. Any pulse? Not a certain. Any I only feel one pulse. In the book, they would say. Yeah, meaning you've got a radial pulse, you know automatically that they're going to have the other two. Unless one's been cut from, you know. Okay? Okay. There is no more cup status. This has been removed from New York State. Okay? When I became an EMT, I had to make a cup status. Cups, it means critical, unstable, potentially unstable, and stable. Now it's been now it's been all lumped into two. You have to make a transport decision when you've done all that. Is your transport decision going to be load and go? Or is your transport decision going to be... Stay in play. Wow. I got all this. Stay in play. Okay? And that is what your job's going to be. Are you going to load and go? Or are you going to stay in play? So it doesn't matter when he's Load and go stay play. Right? You have to make that decision. Now on your state exam, I can tell you right now, it's always going to be load and go. Load and, go. and it's not, it's not a decision of movement. It's a decision of consciousness. 
It's what am I going to do? It doesn't mean that you load and go that second. It means that you decide this patient needs to move to the hospital. Obviously the arrests, anything with, you know, uh, major trauma, poor general impression, all these things. I, I don't really go into all this too much. You'll understand. If it's a serious patient, load and go. If they stub their toe, you can stay in play. These are just some different things um, that um, that may be load and goes. Okay, fall from more than twenty feet. That's considered a serious fall, serious trauma. Okay, remember that. Fall from more than twenty feet. Someone falling from twenty feet and landing on their legs will probably break their leg. Like somebody feet? No. They may have spinal cord injuries okay. also. Okay, but yeah. Okay, high risk patients. Just read. Sure right? Yeah, it's okay. All right. You understand this? This is really where the. This is really where the primary assessment is going to end. Primary assessment is going to end with your transport decision. Okay? And that's a big step in the patient assessment. From here on in, we're going to do a whole bunch of other things. Okay? What is called the rapid scan. Now, this is another big debate. Okay? Um, it's a controversial lecture. It is. So the first thing is primary, and then the second thing would be the rapid scan. Is well, that, the that transport decision. I'll show you the breakdown soon. So the rapid scan. Here's, here's the issue. New York State does not really include the rapid scan as part of their... part of their... <laughs> mandatory things that you gotta do. However, in real life, we actually do the rapid scan all the time. So, we want to consider the rapid scan while we're studying, and we're gonna do a rapid scan until we get much, much closer to the state exam. Okay. So the rapid scan is going to be a rapid trauma assessment of these parts. Head, neck, chest, abdomen, pelvis, extremities, and then the posterior. All right? No, it's head to toe. It's head to toe. It's really, it's really easy. This is stuff we're going to learn on skill nights. I'm not going to get into this now because it's obviously better have it demonstrated, you watch it, you'll see it, you'll do it. So this is a good slide just so you know what you're going to be looking for. Have we done this, DCAP BTLS? No. No? no? First time we're seeing the boo-boos? All right, you need to learn this. You need to learn this, this acronym, this Russia Tavis, DCAP BTLS. All right, there will be many questions on this, even in the state exam. Okay, what is the A of DCAP BTLS? Stuff like that. All right, these are the easy questions. These are the giveaways, okay? These are ones you don't even need to think about. You just know it, okay? So you learn, DCAP BTLS. These are things we look for. Small, non-life-threatening boo-boos, okay? And it's... It, shouldn't need any explanation, right? Anybody not familiar with any of these words? Shraggy? <laughs> oh, that was hurtful. <laughs> hurtful is not one of the words. <laughs> Most of these are hurtful. There's no way Confusions are what? Bruises? Yes. Vital signs. We'll talk about, we've spoken about those at length. Okay, here are my, my pupils again. 
Let's look at them. Let's make sure we understand them. We've had a similar slide to this before. We should know this. First one up here are? Constricted. Constricted. How do I get those? Light in the eyes. Cocaine. Okay. No, light in the eyes makes it dilated. No, light, no, light, 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 light in the eyes. Light in the eyes. Which light drug light. am I taking? Uh, heroin. 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 Thank you. Or I prefer the word opioids. Anything from the poppy plant. All right. Percocets, oxycodone. Okay, these are a few of my favorite things. All right, this does this. Great stuff. Now, dilated, huge, big eyes. What drugs am I on? Crack okay. Barbiturates? See, why do you think so bad? The guys came out of the optometrist. Laughing, guys. No, you're right. He's on cocaine, crack, crack cocaine, all that sort of stuff does that. Unequal pupils! Head injury. Head injury. Head injury. Right? And that's why it's here, because... Possible, possible way. Obviously, right, we're looking now at trauma, major trauma. So we're looking for... But there are other things that cause unequal yeah. damage. TBIs, traumatic brain injuries, and NTBIs, non-traumatic brain injuries. Both, yes. <laughs> Sample, you know? Yeah. Froggy? Yeah. Even I know that. <laughs> Fantastic. That will be our level of determining how well we know it. I know it, we can move forward. <laughs> Sample, everybody make sure you know this, okay? If you don't know it, make sure you know it. All right? It's simple. It's... No, sample. Sample. <laughs> sample. Over the counter. Okay? Good. Uh, it's your can be like really, it's really detailed. You gotta put everything in there. Yeah. As you're doing what? As, like I mean, you also gotta be treating the patient. Right. You write the ACL later at the hospital. So you gotta remember what medications are on there, really. Mm-hmm. That's why there's two of you. They take little notes while you're doing it off, like the little notepad. Yeah, yeah. but the guy's driving. So you take notes while you take it on the way. <laughs> All right, secondary assessment. We did the primary, now we're going to move into the secondary assessment. So, look what, guys, test question. Why do we do a secondary assessment? Because it can change. No. Non-life-threatening injuries. Thank you. I'm that guy that pushes his head. Okay, here, I'm not gonna read all this to you, all right? But this is a short couple of sentences which you should read on each part of the secondary assessment. <coughs> here are some trauma centers. Some of you have visited some of them on your rotations already. All right? Here's the burns again, burn guy. Oh, you put the new dude in. Sad because he's The burn lobster guy, we put the new guy in. Yeah. All right, yeah. updated all the slides. Updated this one. Except his one is the second one. Is the one. Is this you know already, burn sense. No, I'm like that. Okay, good. I want you to please turn to page 35 in the other book. The Navy book. What's the year at the bottom of that page 35? 1982. 2012. 2012. 2012. Red. Red 2012. Copyright. Should I pause this? Yeah.
of this. I made this because I kept teaching refresher classes many, many years ago. I think this started, I started doing this in about 2006. Then I did a revision in 2009, and now this is the 2012 updated one. What happened was that in refresher classes, nobody remembered the steps on how to do a child patient assessment. They got through EMT school, somehow managed to pass, and then never really understood it. So I created this. This is a method for you to use from the next practicals that we do, trauma patient assessment until the state exam. And then you can use it in real life, right? This is a method for you to use that you can perform a practical state exam or a true trauma patient assessment on a patient. These are the steps that you need. The difference between real life and the classroom. Okay? In real life, there are two people, maybe four people, all doing stuff simultaneously. In the state exam, there is just you. It's very linear. You have to say everything out loud that you're doing. And you have an imaginary partner who pretty much does next to nothing. Okay? So, you're doing everything. In real life, there'll be you, your, your partner, you'll be working together simultaneously. It will be multi-dimensional. You won't say, okay, partner, I'm now going to expose the leg. You know, you're not going to do that. You're just going to do it. Um, in the state exam, it's very linear. You've got to state everything that you're doing. You've got to ask questions to the examiner who is playing both the patient and the examiner. So this is a method that I developed. Thousands of students have done very well using it. If other instructors give you other methods, um, they're not as good. Uh, you can certainly, you can certainly use them. It's, it's entirely up to you. I don't care what method you use. Um, but don't tell me that you had a problem on the final if you used any other method. So. I don't want to hear it, okay? But you're certainly free to use any method that works for you, okay? Here we go. Here are the rules of this paper, rules of engagement, all right? <laughs> Everything is divided into vertical columns. You cannot skip between one column and the next. If something is numbered, then it is done in that order, okay? Everything else except for BSI scene safety, Within the column, if you botch it up or you want to rearrange the column, go right ahead. Within the column. Don't skip something here and then jump to this column. Ah, oh, I forgot this over there and trying to backpedal. Okay? Stay in the column. You change the order, I have no problem with that. Stay in the column. Finish the column. Move to the next. Um, if it's in bold, for example, that and all of this, if it's in bold, and you skip it, omit it, forget it, you fail automatically. All right? If it's not in bold, uh, like these first letters over here, that's bold, these are not. So um, if it's not in bold and you skip it, you're just going to lose some points, but you can easily recover. That's the rules. I'm going to go through it. You're going to take notes. Um, if at some point we need to make copies of these blank, uh, we, can, we can arrange that. Um, shouldn't be a problem, but you will certainly need this during your next few uh, skill nights to help you along. Okay? All right, this is how it works. So we're practicing. Hmm? So we're practice you know, you sure. From now till the end. This is how it goes. Scene size up is going to start off always with BSI and scene safety. It's all written out for you. You know what that means. All right, here we go. The first acronym, MAILS. MAILS. M stands for? A mechanism of injury. M-O-I. Very good. Mechanism of injury. A, additional resources. 
Okay? What help do I need? Eye impression of the patient. Again, male, female, proximate age, way found, position found, and what they look like. L. L stands for life threats and life check. So this is the first time you're actually going to touch your patient and see if they are alive, right? Do we need an assessment for a dead patient? Yeah. Is there an assessment for a dead patient? Well, who says yeah, you have to know whether they're dead or not. No. Okay, so you did that. Now we're doing no. that. Do we need to do all this for a no. dead patient? No. no. What do we do? Baltimore. No. No. What do you do for a dead patient? CPR. Thank you. CPR. I can't believe we got these answers no, at this he, point. <laughs> they're referring to like decapitation. I don't care what they're Obvious referring to. Of, no, you still CPR. The first order of well, CPR is that decapitated is a contraindicated CPR. Have two, not if you have three things uh, that prove he's dead. That's a contraindicated CPR. Oh, oh, he's dead. Eli's That's definition of dead is that there's no pulse. Apneic compulsus. Right? So L, life threats and life check. So, look at the patient. Don't touch. Do you see what would be a life threat that you could see without touching the patient? Spurning, spurning artery. I like that one. That's what I was looking for. Why? I'll go with that. Like, why? What about knife in the head? Okay. <laughs> Anywhere knife. What, but what are you, is there anything you can do for the knife in the head? Try to secure it with uh, That's going to save his life? No. Bring him to the life hospital. threats and life check. What is there that's going on right now that you could fix right away? So, you bend down, you feel for a carotid pulse. Check the breathing at the same time. Is there a pulse? Are they breathing in the state exam? The answer is always going to be yes. But you have to bend down and take that pulse. Okay? Ask. All right? Does my patient have a pulse? Are they breathing? Are they alive? Life check, life threats. L. S, spinal immobilization. Now we're changing that to spinal motion restriction, SMR. For now, you can just write spinal immobilization. It'll be good enough. How do you do that? You actually, right now, you take your imaginary partner and say, hold his head like that. That's all you do. That's spinal motion restriction right there. That's fine. Okay? C. CH had to get in there, right? Call you. you C. The number of patients. CH 38. Additional resources. No, hold on. No, no, no. He's right. Wait till I finish. C. Chief complaint. Chief complaint. Why did they call an ambulance? Why did the bystanders call the ambulance? H, 47, here we go. How many patients? Hopefully not 47. But by additional resources, would you potentially encounter that then? If you see five people laying on the floor, you can again, right away say Again, again. Prime, you're thinking like a normal human being uh, and the way that it would maybe be done in the field. In the state exam, since it's linear, it makes no sense particularly. Just go with it. And again, if you want to change the order within the column, go right ahead. As long as it's not numbered. Yeah. Go right ahead. Change it to any order you want. Many students, once they practice this a little while, like to get that S out of the way first. Okay? Because that's the only thing that's... You up. That uh, will will fail you immediately. So they like oh. to come in, BSI scene safety partner, hold manual stabilization. <laughs> no, and it's fine. It, it's okay. That's within you're within the rules of staying in the column. H claims. All right. So there you go. So that's male CH. Everybody got that? Additional resources yeah. is. Asking for a partner? What no, you come with a partner. So what? So what? What is it? What is the aid? Additional, additional resources. resources. Do you need another ambulance? Do you need ALS? Do you need oh. fire department, police? A sandwich. 
Yeah. <laughs> All right, here, LOC, what does it stand for here? Level of, Level of consciousness. What are my four options? Alert, 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 alert. Write them in. So that you've got it. How are you going to calculate this? How are you going to figure this out? What are you going to do? Ask questions. Yeah. Good. So you're going to start off by asking questions. He doesn't answer your questions. What are you going to do now? Check for your uh, screen. Pinch him. Pinch him. Screen. Pinch him, right? Hurt him. Top of her shoulder. Okay. Is he not? It's not a little like a nice puppy. It's a right. Okay. Really? Um, nice grab. Response. Yes. Place where you do it. Pain. Pain. Can we pretend they're unresponsive? Ellie, can you demonstrate on the try? <laughs> Show him what you do. <laughs> on him. Are you said up here or? No, what I do, I told you. I do the sternum. Knuckle on the sternum. sternum. Hard, up and down, right here. What do you do? What do you do? He's like, Gosh, right. It's like yeah. I was here. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You go up and down the sternum. Oh, it hurts. Like, deep and yeah. hard. It hurts. Yeah. It hurts. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you feel it for days. But I will never forget that if you do it right now. Uh, it's okay. Okay, moving okay. right along. So, are we good with the first column? Yeah. yeah. Right? It's really simple. This is really simple. Just remember, remember. Yeah. Remember the steps. All right. Airway. <laughs> airway. There are three things that you need to take care of in the airway. Okay? Here's what they, I'll tell you the three main words, and then there are two ways that every EMT can accomplish these three things, okay? So leave space. C-O-M-A, clear, open, maintain the airway. C-O-M-A, clear, you could put the A after each one. Clear the airway, open the airway, maintain the airway. I just didn't want to get stuck with come and then no A, so I did. <laughs> coma because you don't want that in the airway. So clear, open, maintain the airway. That's why we've got the A. Alright? But there's only three steps that you've got to do. Clear. Come on EMTs. There are two ways to clear an airway. What are they? Suction is one. Finger sweep is two. Write them down. Which one do I use which? I don't want you giving the instructor options. I want you telling the instructor, this is what I'm going to do. So, when do I use the suction? And when do I use a finger sweep? Suction, suction if it's liquid. When you see, when you liquid see. for a suction. suction. And if it's a big finger sweep, if you see something, not an object. Oh, we're talking about you see something. Object. But what's now what? A now we're breaking down how we're actually going to remove it. So if it's Campbell's thick and chunky, <laughs> Right? There you go. I know he was chicken in his soup. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, a thick gumbo soup. You can suction the liquid. What are you gonna do with the rice and the chicken? You need a combination of suction. Then you need a combination. Yes. Or, or you just have it there. You take it out. Again. Yes. They, you're going to ask the examiner questions. Oh, you... What is in the airway? He's going to tell you. Blood, vomit, Campbell's thick and chunky. Whatever he and decides, you have, you have to know how you're going to proceed. Gotcha. So clear the airway. What are my two options? Suction and finger sweep. Open the airway. OPA and No, actually not. No. Head, chin lift. Head tilt, chin lift, or? or jaw thrust. Modified jaw thrust. Jaw thrust. Now, do not give these two options, because you will fail for being a moron, right? Because remember, he started the exam by saying that this patient fell out of the fifth story window, yeah. so then, for example. Ah. So which one are you going to use? Sure. Sure. Very good. Make sure you... Is that an example? It's always going to start as a trauma patient? This is the with, trauma patient assessment. With a potential spinal injury. Not necessarily. Uh, you have to listen to the story. Okay, so it's not always going to be. It's oh, always going to be. Okay, it's always going to be. Gotcha. And hey, would you actually do it on them, or, they, or you don't actually start touching them? Oh, this is very hands-on, but guess what? You've got your partner already standing there doing the 
doing the spinal, he, you would tell him to do the jaw thrust. Because if you get stuck doing the jaw thrust, how are you going to do the rest of the assessment? Mm -hmm. So this, you now have your partner do. Ah. Okay? Can you imagine your partner do it? I mean, yeah. All right? However, you have to say. say. You can't tell him to do it when you get to the S first time, right? No. Because that's not in the airway column. Okay. Make sure. See, that's what I mean. You, you, you are telling him to. Now, head stabilization, but not jaw thrust. Hold the head and then do a jaw thrust. And then go on to airway. Yeah. Don't mix the columns. Oh, I think you can't tell your, your imaginary partner to do the stuff. Right. In real life, it's all done simultaneous. Again, this is linear. One step at a time. So we've opened the airway. Very good. M. Maintain. Maintain. What are my two ways? OPA and MPA. Well, not MPA because he has a head injury. Very good. Very good. So I want you to know both ways because we're going to soon do the medical patient and we need to keep it the same. Okay? Even though New York State does everything in its power to make the trauma and the medical completely different, I made them identical. So that's just later you'll see. Fighting the system. This is part of the rebellion. I don't know, rebellion. <laughs> this is part of what I do. Right. To make students actually understand what it is they're doing. Not be robots. Right? Not being robots. Okay, are we good with coma? Yeah. Yes. How cool is that, right? <laughs> Three things you gotta do clear, open, maintain the airway. Make sure you say the right thing. There are two ways of doing each. Make sure you know both, and make sure you only tell the examiner the one that makes sense for the case scenario that he has presented. There's always going to be a jaw thrust and an OPA because it's going to be a trauma. Well, let's just keep our options open. Gotcha, just in case. Right. The, you might not have to use the S in males if it's not a, if there's no suspected hedge. Um, right, but like I said, there will, will be. <laughs> Are we good? Can we move on to breathing? Yeah, okay. Notice we did airway, we didn't mention anything about Oxygen or lungs, all right, because all that is nothing to do with airway. Airway is the ability to breathe. The ability to breathe, yeah. not to yeah. get, it's not even to yeah. breathe. The, oh, the ability of getting air from outside to inside. Okay? These are the three things breathing, which is the B step, A, B, right? And we're going to do a town in Texas called El Paso. And that's how we're going to remember the steps. Good, but I spell it differently. Well, it's a different number in Texas, huh? This is a town in Texas called El Paso with two S's. All right? And it's El Paso. Yes. It's the El Paso Railroad. Yeah. Or it's Elp. <laughs> oh. Okay? And bingo. Was Good game. <laughs> You can read it any way you want. You want to put a comma after the P, that's fine. All right, here we go. E, expose. Which part of the body do I want to see? Chest. 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 Does what? No, why does it depend? Think what you're saying. What step are we in? Breathing. You want to see the rest of it? Chest rise. Chest rise. Chest rise. Expose. Cut it off. Get the clothes off. Do we do that in the stage now? Absolutely. <laughs> Here the party on starts. The instructor. Oh, yeah. On the instructor. <laughs> on the examiner. The stage test is also the patient. You're undressing the teeth of the professor. In the state exam, the, the uh, potential uh, patient will be wearing a lab coat. Um, looks like a kittle. Or oh, something, you've got to open that thing up. Yeah, something in between. Okay, guys. question I about the female instructor. Yeah. Guys, let's just focus. Female instructor. Female instructor. Guys, guys. Make believe there's a female instructor there. E for? Expose. Expose. L, look. What are we looking for? Chest rise. Chest rise. Chest rise, only one thing. What else? Come on. Um, anything, any Look, wounds. Or... Wounds, yep. Yeah. An impaled object. Impaled objects, good. A Come on. A rib stick. Is this under breathing? Yeah. Absolutely. What else? 
rib sticking out. Rib sticking Flail out. Chest. Okay, flail chest. That's okay. more what I would say. Yes. How do you find it? What about what's a hole in the chest called? Pneumothorax. Pneumothorax. All right, sucking chest wound. Right. Potential pneumothorax. Right. All these things. Very good. This is what we're looking for. P. Don't write all that. That oh. stuff you should just know chest off to the side. Right. Just write. Chest look. So on the exam, oh. we're gonna have to say oh, no. look. Yeah. But he may ask you, what are you looking for? Right? Yeah. He said, look, I'm looking. What are you yeah. looking for? Well, right, you right. just cut off the shirt. Why'd you cut the shirt off? Because Eliana said I should. <laughs> Good. Now I told you to look. What are you looking, are you for? looking for? Test drive. P. P. Palpate. Palpate. That means feel. touch, feel. Okay. We'll show you how to palpate the ribs. Okay. We'll show you on skill night how to actually do that. Uh, basically, you're going to do this. You're going to come from the shoulders across the clavicle, okay, down the sternum and out around the rib cage. Okay, we're looking for flail chest, we're looking for uh, yeah, loss of integrity of the rib cage, stuff what like that. What does flail chest feel like? Why? You be you'll feel section. part of the ribs fall Listen, in, yes. As you push, you'll feel something. Yeah, sure. A. A. Ascotate. Huh? Listen. Huh? State question. A what U does ascotate mean? U S Ascotate with a U. A U ascotate. Ascotate with a U. Yeah. Ascotate with a U. Not ascotate. Don't spin them around. Ascotate. Listen. Stethoscope. Okay, we'll show you how to do that on, on skill night. S and S. Seal and stabilize. Seal and stabilize. What do we seal? Open chest, chest wound. wound. Open chest wound. Very good. What do we stabilize? Bleeding. Knife. Knife. Impaled object. Right? At least stabbed to the head. Right? <laughs> From the chest. Yeah. <laughs> All right, all that stuff. All right, so now we're up to here, the star. Star just means think. Star just means think for a second. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. And look down here. This is respiratory rate. And O is oxygen, O2. So before we actually give the oxygen, we're going to have to actually think and make a decision. All right, let's think. An EMT can only use two, two oxygen delivery devices in this situation. Okay? They are the non-rebreather mask, which is used for what type of breathing? Adequate breathing. And the BVM, which is used for inadequate breathing. <laughs> the star or the pause is you got to figure out what breathing are they in. Are they inadequate or are they in inadequate breathing? New York State says below eight is inadequate. inadequate. So the first thing you want to do is ask the instructor. Are they breathing adequately? Are they breathing adequately? What's the respiratory rate? Okay. Now, the best question to ask is, are they breathing adequately? Because then, if they say yes, then you go with... Then I rebreathe it. If they say no, then you go with the BVM and you you're good. Them, if you ask them a number, then you need to know the scale. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the scale is below eight, use the BVM. Above eight, well, try and not rebreathe it. If the, if the instructor was smart, they'd respond with a number. Yes. yes. <laughs> but they're not always that smart. Using the BVM, even though there are respirations. Yes. Yeah. Like if you don't have that, then you do I mean, that's not Below eight, definitely. Okay. Now, I personally disagree with this whole philosophy. I have my own way of doing it. If you're ever on scene with me, you'll see it done very differently. I didn't see that as one of the rotation options. Right. <laughs> Wasn't offered. However, this is what New York State is, is uh, mandating. Okay, so inadequate respirations, which they define as less than eight. BVM, adequate. Remember, dead or apneic, respiratory distress also it's not, it's is, not, it's not, it's not adequate. Not adequate. All right, that's breathing. El Paso, town in Texas. Remember those steps. Any order you want, as long as you get them all. 
Yes? Yeah. Moving on to circulation. Remember, we did A, B, C. C, we have PBS. Propriety prism. <laughs> <laughs> prism will come later. Oh, sorry. He did say he will show <laughs> PBS. So I imagine everybody in this room knows what PBS is. Because when I do this in Williamsburg, nobody knows what PBS is. TV station. Sesame Street. Sesame Street. That's what they show? Right. Okay. Well, PBS. Shabbos. Shabbos, I was by the table telling over a story. To my father-in-law and I told him that my patient had PMS in the feet. So my sister and daughter look at each other like, was PMSing in the feet? <laughs> what was wrong with him? Was it, it was a man like they were freaking out. So you have to be careful who you say what to because you know not everybody understands our terminology. Well, that's that's all? All? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's like Sounds like he's a big guy. Yeah. 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 No shit up now. CH24. On the wedding invitation, that's what it's CH13? Yeah. An honor parent, CH24, CH13. CH13. Alright. PBS. PBS. P stands for presence of pulses. The main word is pulses. Presence of pulses. Now, who can intelligently deduce, not guess, which pulse I want you to check at this time. Radial. Right. Wow. Shraggy, top of the class. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why the radio? <laughs> Alright, I won't push, I won't push my love. It's this though. It's 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 that you want to know how strong it is. That's yeah. No, so the furthest one. Right? That there furthest one. Good, it's the most distal. And your partner's hands are around the guy's neck already. Right, but give me even a better reason why this is a radio pulse. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. Shock. You suspect you had See if he's in shock, right? Because we know if he doesn't have one. But why else? Why else? I'm not trying to give any hints. I said he has his neck and he has his spinal. No, I'm not pointing to the lights. Uh, if the, if the right. pulse is... He, he has no pulse, so you go straight to see the Do it again without giving hints to see where you put <laughs> Why else is this a radial pulse? So far you're saying very good things, everybody. Because you checked you checked the pulse here. Yes. And now you checked the pulse yeah, here. Yeah, you did it already, uh, like 30 seconds ago. Remember life threat, life check? You did that. So you know he has a radial pulse. So if I check it again, what new information am I going to get? Second well, you know radial pulse. That's your second. But you yeah. know that here. I'm saying, man, correct. You said the second radial pulse. So what new information would I get if I check it again? You see that there's no change. No, that there is, wasn't not, enough time between not, here and here. Not, so basically, you shouldn't check there. You checked here already. So, so here, check, 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 right here. Now you check, check a radial pulse, what right? Did you check over that the is line? no the L is, is carotid. This is carotid. Life oh. threat, life, life check. Life, life check. Okay, so it makes check. sense. So pulse this is a radial pulse. Yeah. Also based on what we said that the 60, 70, 80 rule, which will mean that he's probably not in shock yet if he has, okay, a uh, a a radial pulse. So there you go. So by, with a so trauma, by, let me just finish this thought. With a trauma, you really want to check both radial pulses at the same time. Okay? If you, someone walks onto your ambulance and says, I'm not feeling well, I've been throwing up for a few days, yeah, you put on your gloves, you check a radial pulse, fantastic. But what if somebody fell out of a fifth story window? Do you think checking one radial pulse and saying, oh, there's no radial pulse, they're in shock? Do you think that would be accurate? No, no. Maybe, has be maybe he landed on, on his hand. hand. On his hand, and now that whole arm is right. AFU, for it to use a medical term, right? So the other one he may have. The other one may have uh, radio pulse. Radio pulse. So just checking one isn't always good enough. Therefore, in this case, we want to do both bilateral radial pulses. Yes, what's your question? My question was, by the, by the males, you would do you do a, a carotid, and over there you're doing the radial? Is that, that's, that would be the procedure? Yeah. So you took both radial pulses. Uh, at the same over time. here, oh. in the circulation step. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. Uh -huh. B stands for bleeding. I'm talking major hemorrhage. Major. Venous bleeding, arterial bleeding. I'm talking about bleeding that you didn't notice when you looked at him, but now you cut off more clothing, you're able to examine him better, you're seeing some major... I'm not talking about a little patch of dry blood. I don't, we don't care about that. We're still in the primary assessment, okay? So we don't really want to get into small little bleeding. What we're looking for is major hemorrhage. Okay? When you're doing P, you're doing it for 30 seconds or you're just checking to see? Presence. You don't need a number. Do I have pulses? Okay, B is bleeding, major hemorrhage. S, split into three. S is skin. And we check three things. Here they are, CTC. You gotta know what that Color. stands for. Color, Color temperature, temperature condition. Now here's where you would do the rapid scan. It is in italics, just to show that we're going to do it at the beginning, or maybe we'll drop it later, but we're gonna start off doing it. And then we get to our transport decision. And I gave it to you. Wow. Thanks. Color temperature. Test answer. Condition. Te color temperature condition. CTC. This is really gonna be only if the patient is under if you come in the patient's unresponsive. Oh. They're always going to be. Okay, in real life, the transport decision stands for something. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No, don't get nervous. I would let down just like I gave it a good shot. <laughs> Load and go. Any decisions, Miss Mel? No S. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, he said he doesn't smell. I've been doing. That's I've had this paper since. That's it. I always wrote up the first typo out of every single page. So I thought you got it. This is so old. It's a great question. Like like that. That. <laughs> About you know, pointing out an error. It's too long for What are you looking for? Good. Can we move on? Yeah. What are you looking for in condition? It's the color. No. Uh -oh. Really? Yeah. Color. What are you looking for? Pale. Is it cyanotic? Is it cyanotic? Or Wait, I want you to take a note somewhere on colors, because a student from 10 years ago came to me and told me <laughs> that he didn't teach me one of the colors, he had a complaint. He wants his money <laughs> back. So let me just run through some colors that every EMT has to know. It should really make a color slide for it, but I, I just didn't do it yet. Listen, colors, you ready? Blue, hypoxia, it's called cyanosis, smurf. Very good. Pale, white, pallor, P-A-L-L-O-R, pallor. That's the medical term for it. Red. 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 Sunburn. Could be, or it could be other things. Fever. Fever. Yeah, so it's a color. And the last one, apparently I didn't teach this student, is jaundice, yellow. Liver disease. Liver disease. Babies I'm sure be, I taught it. Babies but. could be joined this when they're born, right? Yes, like very often, very normal. No risk. Billy no, Rubin. I thought joined this kidney failure. It can't, yeah. Liver. 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 Kidney. No, it's liver. Liver, liver. liver. And they look. Are you okay? They they look if they have a low Billy Rubin, that makes them yellow. Uh, no, 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 he's and right. Eyes also. Okay, okay. Well, let's, let's focus. Color, temperature, hot, cold, warm, normal, condition. Dry, sweaty, clammy, diaphoretic. Okay? Diaphoretic with a pH. Good. What is that again? P for pneumonia. Did the Willie guys get that one, by the way? Did you try it? Like P for pneumonia? No, I didn't get that yet. We're not up today yet. What was red? They won't get anyone. Pneumonia. P for Peter. You're doing another class simultaneously during the week? At the same pace. Like 11 classes. No, behind. No. When are you going to call? Shabbos morning. What's he bothering him? He's going to leave. All right. Yeah. 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 We now have. Guys, guys, come on, let's focus. We're, we're doing okay. But let's focus. Oh, and what was condition you said? Clam. Uh, uh, cool, cool, clammy, clammy <laughs> dry. Yeah. <laughs> Did we arrange a stander? <laughs> No. Basement. <laughs> it's in the basement. Everything's in the basement. All right. 
This is the five step program to get you home, okay? You gotta follow the five step program. It's really easy, just follow it. Step number one, history or sample history, okay? You know how to do sample. Now, the patient is unresponsive, they're laying on the floor, and now you gotta ask them about meds and allergies. Do you think they're gonna answer you? No. If you no. Make it loud enough. <laughs> there are two ways to get the answer for them. Okay, there's one way to get the answer. Either they can answer you, which obviously if they're unresponsive, they can't. The other option is to ask a friend or a family member who is with them. In the trauma patient assessment, the sample history is only one point. It's not a critical and it's not worth five points like in the medical. So all you do is you say to the examiner, can I get a sample history from anybody? They will say no, and that's it. Done. You don't even have to explain what S and A and M and L and everything means later. Secondary assessment. This is a major in-depth head-to-toe examination of your patient. I have given you a page from my colleague who wrote up very nicely how to do the head-to-toe examination. It's on page 37 and 38, but the main part, no, it's really only on 38. Okay, so there's some notes there. You have the notes in my lectures of how to do it, but really, you want to witness and observe it being done on skill night and learn how to do it. It's so simple, it's head to toe. Head to toe, you just gotta name every major body part, what you're looking for and how you're checking it. It's really easy, but that is the secondary assessment. Okay? It's, it's, a, it's a head to toe check. Um, Ellie, this is where you'll find your pride person. Okay? I know you were concerned, so I pointed that out for you. To me, I was before I came tonight, I was like, okay, spinal mobilization, then check for the pride Right. Right, so there is a little bit in between. All right, number three. What's perineum? Seriously? No, Seriously. No, 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 no. Good. Number three. I can't believe you asked that. Right now. Number three. Vital signs. Vital signs. Now, what are the three vital signs that we're interested in right now? Pulse. Pulse, blood pressure, and respiratory rate. Okay? For interventions and TX, TX is medicine short for treatment. Interventions and treatment. Whatever you found in your secondary assessment, okay, which were non-life-threatening things, need to be treated. So if, the pa so if the examiner tells you, well, your patient had a broken, looked like a deformed right tibia, so what are you going to do? Splint. You're going to splint it, right? You're going to fix it. Number five is your ongoing assessment. This is the last acronym for tonight. <laughs> but extremely important. What's CX for? Transport. Transport? But didn't we do the transport? No. This is before no, no. we start moving. Is that what it is? Whatever you found in your body, second body. Yeah. I don't know what the X is for. Let me just finish. Ongoing assessment. Step five of the five-step program, okay? Now, it's step five, the acronym is five. This is to tell you that for an unstable patient, you do this every? Five minutes. Five minutes. That's a question, okay? They also ask, how often do you do this for a stable patient? The answer is 15, take a note. So, unstable, which is the one we're dealing with here, is done every five minutes. Five minutes. Stable? 15. 15. What are my four things that I gotta do? Very simple. Five, right? So you gotta remember. Five. F start, stands for focused exam. What's a focused exam? It's an exam on whatever you found to be the problem. 
all right? If his left little pinky toe is okay and you've checked it at least twice, do you need to recheck it all the way to the hospital? No. No. Um, if, so that's five. So focus the exam, whatever you found to be a problem, whatever you decide, this is something that we fixed or whatever, focus on it and recheck it every five minutes. I, I stands for initial assessment. Remember we changed the name to primary, okay? But I still use both and I use both throughout the, throughout the class, so primary or initial. What is my initial assessment? Whenever you thought of the... No, what are the three things in my initial assessment? Airway breathing, sir. Airway breathing and circulation. So what it means is keep them alive. Keep the patient alive. Focus on what you found to be wrong, but never forget airway breathing circulation. You've got to make sure your patient arrives alive. V stands for, repeat, V, vital signs. Every, remember this is always every five, five, five minutes. minutes. And the last thing is everything you did for the patient. If you bandaged a small bleeding wound, make sure that that bandage is doing its job. If you gave him oxygen, make sure the mask and the oxygen is running properly. If, whatever you did, everything, everything you did for the patient, make sure that this patient continues with the treatments that you gave him. How's that different than the F? Uh, F is more the body part that you need to focus on. You need to focus on various body systems. So let's say he had this uh, sucking chest wound. So we're concerned about the sucking chest wound such as that we make sure that it's not sealed on all four sides and he's still able to breathe so we need to play with it. So we know he has a sucking chest wound, we have to continue to evaluate it. All right, et cetera. Okay. <laughs> so, spinal motion restriction. In 2015, New York State abolished the use of backboards for transportation of patients. Until then, for the last, uh, I don't know, 30, 50 years, I don't remember, Backboards were used constantly for trauma patients, for suspected trauma patients, for anybody that we thought had a head or neck injury. In 2015, New York State joined the other states and places around the world and have now abolished the use of backboards, long, hard spinal backboards. We still carry them on ambulances. They still have a purpose. However, it is not the purpose that it used to be, and everybody had to be retrained. Every single EMT and medic in the state had to take an updated training to learn the new way that we are going to deal with spinal um, motion restriction. Now it used to be called spinal stabilization or spinal immobilization. Those terms have now been removed and now we're left with this spinal motion restriction. These are three pretty simple English terms that mean don't move the spine around. That's all it means. Okay? It doesn't mean immobilization, which is what we used to do. So here's how it works. Why are we not doing immobilization anymore? Well, we found out that patients were actually getting hurt by being put on a backboard for 30 minutes to an hour or longer. Uh, it's extremely uncomfortable. Uh, increased time of immobilization, laying on a hard backboard, supine, increased pain, increased problems with aspiration. Can't tell you how many times that you have a patient on a backboard, all of a sudden they decide to vomit. So if they vomit and they're supine on a backboard, they can't move. So they vomit, right? What's going to happen? 
It's going to go all over you and your partner. That's the bigger problem, right? Oh, the problem for the patient, right? It's going to aspirate. Aspirate means go into their airway. You don't, but if they're... If you're immobilizing their, what's their spines? And then relax, goes, so. relax. So, we're going to use the nexus criteria. Now, there are many different criteria that can be used. Um, there is an Australian one, a Canadian one, and I forget, don't care which one is which. I want to go with the nexus because it's easy, it's simple, and with a simple mnemonic uh, acronym, you can remember how to do this. So I just changed this, like last week I came up with this new thing. I used to use admin, many of you will have admin in your notes and that works just fine. I actually spoke to an EMS educator in South Africa and I told him about using admin and how it works and he loved it. And then last week I woke up one day and said out of their mind, absent minds, okay? So I changed it and now this is where I want to go with. You know, first class that I'm presenting minds to. So, minds, this is the one, absent minds. They don't have minds or they're out of their minds, all right? Then they would fit the nexus criteria um, and we will tell you how we're going to treat them differently. So what are they? M stands for Mental Status Changes or AMS. So in the old one admin it was AMS, now we can go with Mental Status Changes, minds. I, intoxication, this means drugs, drink, any of the above or all of the above. N, Neurological Deficits. So here we're talking about they can't move one of their extremities, that would be a neurological deficit, or they have paresthesia, which is a word you should know, it means numbness or tingling in one of their extremities. D is a distracting injury. So if they say, um, I'm fine, my back is fine, my spine is fine, but I've got this uh, deep uh, six inch blade sticking out of my knee, okay, and that's what's killing me. That's a distracting injury. They cannot tell us truly about their spine, neck, back because of the distracting injury, so then they would fail. And S is spinal tenderness. So we got to actually palpate midline spine uh, from the neck and all the way down and see if they grimace, if there's pain, if it hurts, or whatever. So what does all this mean to you and me in the field? What are we, when are we doing this? Right. What does this mean to you and me in the field? I'm going to explain. In the old days, you came on scene. In the old days, you came on scene. You saw a ladder. You saw a patient on the floor. You put two and two together. You decided he fell from the ladder. He has a possible head neck injury, boom, he got a collar, he got a backboard, he got strapped down, he got these special blocks around his head, and he was completely immobilized. That's how we did it in the old days. You were in a car accident, good enough, headbed, blocks, backboard, that's how it was. It was enough, you were in a car accident, you were next to a ladder, now you're on the floor. You fell down a flight of stairs, boom. 2015, New York State said no more. So the backboard has completely been abolished. You cannot transport a patient on a backboard. You're allowed to use the backboard to get the patient from point A to your stretcher. And once they're on the stretcher, they have to be removed from the backboard. And we'll teach you how to do that on skill nights. But what stayed? What stayed was do you use a collar? Okay, you haven't really seen the collars yet. We'll get to it on skill nights. But do you use a, what's called a cervical collar? Now, a cervical collar now is at your discretion. Do you use a cervical collar for your patient? So here's how it works. You come there, give you a case in point, a call I had last week. 
patients lying in a construction zone, okay? Nobody, of course, knows what happened to him, right? Nobody knows. But there's a ladder over there, and he's laying on the floor, and the EMT said, of course, he's unresponsive, right? Did they hurt him? No. So let's just go with it for now, the way that it was presented to me. What would we have done before 2015? Board, board, board collar, blocks, and blocks tie them down, and put them and go. Put them now, Load did we use board. a backboard? Yes, we did. Well, we actually used a different piece of equipment called a scoop. A scoop yeah, is splits in half. We have it. We have one here. We'll show you how to use it. Splits in half. It's great for moving patients, strap them in, one thing or not. So the question is the collar. Because the collar is still available to anybody who has an absent mind. Okay? Anybody who is absent minded, yes, just coming cut. up with these as I go along. Uh, anybody who is absent minded. You just added ED onto it. So you use right. the collar of somebody has ED. Wait, yes. ED. Okay? He had a private. private. <laughs> I just prefer if they're out of their minds. Okay? Then they're going to get a C collar. They're going to get a collar, cervical collar. So, so, all you do is you run down these things. First of all, they say, ah, oh, my neck, my neck, I can't move my neck. Well, that's it. They're getting the collar. But we're assuming that that isn't happening. So now we need to decide based on what we see. So let's go through. Mental status changes. My patient was had LOC as per the EMTs that, uh, that told me. He was out. He was unresponsive. Does he have mental status changes? Yes. yes. He's at loss of consciousness. Was he intoxicated? No. No. We don't think so. He was on the job. He was definitely working and we couldn't smell any alcohol on breath. <laughs> Did he have neurological deficit? Now until I got him upstairs and I got him talking to me, is there any way for me to know this? No. No. I'll tell you what happened later. Distracting injury, does anything hurt? Again, you've got to ask him if anything else is bothering him. He's unresponsive, so we don't know. Spinal tenderness. So when I got him upstairs, we got him into the ambulance, and he started to open his eyes and communicate. For one of the first things I did, I had the BLS cut off all his clothing and check his entire body part of our trauma patient assessment. And what I did was I removed the collar. Okay? <coughs> now I removed the collar, and what did I do? Check the spine. Check it. Palpate the spine. spine. I didn't remove the collar, I undid it and left it there in place. And as I was palpating down his spine, he grimaced, he winced, he showed me with his face that it hurt. So the collar went back on. So we removed the um, clothing? The, um, <laughs> the scoop. The scoop. Clothing was already gone. And we went to the hospital with him in a collar. Why did he get a collar? So, because of the spinal tenderness. Uh, let's say he wasn't AMS anymore because he was, he answered all my questions. He was A on the AFPU scale at that point. None of these other things applied. However, once I started to assess, his lower extremities, he told me that his legs, he can't move his legs. Yeah, he said he can't move his legs. I told the BLS, the new guy, uh, to check for PMS in both feet, and he found. So his feet, he was able to move. He had PMS, but he couldn't lift his legs. Um, this patient also only spoke Spanish, so it was a good thing that I was able to do the, you know, everything with him and deal with that. That wasn't a problem. And in the hospital, I went into the resource room because none of the staff over there in county that time when we showed up spoke Spanish either until they found somebody. So this absent mind is only regarding a collar? Yeah. Yeah. All this is to clear the C-spine. Clear the C-spine means, see, this is something you were never able to do in the field. You had to do this in the hospital. Like they say, if they look like they've been in a major trauma, collar, board, the whole oh, nine yards. Now, what the state is saying, you can decide yourself. You can actually clear a C-spine. Just gotta know how. 
So I came up with this, either admin or mines, whichever one you want to use. And this is all you got to do, run through one by one. Run through them and see. You have to clear all of these? Yes, all. They as long as they're good with this, then If they, they fail any one of these, then you have to put it, they, they get a column. If that, they do get a column, they don't. Well, not do. fail, I mean fail, and some of them are fail, some of them are. Yeah. I mean, if they're, no. if they are, what, if they're not intoxicated, they have all the rest, they're not going to get a column? No, no, if they, they are intoxicated, so some of them are already yeah. 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 a column. Then don't ever use those double negatives. negatives. It's a double negative. Like right. If someone's intoxicated, they, they get a cop. They get a cop. Even if there's no trauma. No, 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 there has to be a yeah, trauma. What's a trauma? <laughs> <laughs> the trauma is a trauma. guy walking in. Otherwise, the whole time nights nice if we walk here around in a collar. You see a guy in a kid is drug collar. It's a reverse checklist. It's a reverse checklist. Listen, you want to know, does this patient get a collar? Or not? If there is mental status change. So if there is mental status change, if they are not intoxicated, if they have no neurological deficits, no distracting injuries and no spinal tenderness. Then they don't get it. And if they don't have any of these, they don't get a collar. So but if they them. have any of these or they claim their neck and back hurts, they get a collar. So the guy's on the floor, he's drunk, you're going to collar him up? Well, yeah, has he had a trauma? If it was a trauma. You suspect the trauma, then yes. Only if he had a major trauma. Okay? What happened to that too? That means he's paralyzed, he's paralyzed now? At work. Yeah, he's paralyzed, paralyzed at work. Who? The guy is, yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't know what the follow-up was. He can't scan. I think he has a brain bleed. I think he has like an epidural bleed. Yeah. But I don't know. I wasn't able to follow up. All right. So what's the definition? This is the definition. Do you follow up on patients? Very often, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And doctors are allowed to tell you? Yeah. To uh, follow up on patients? Only because you were there? Yeah. Um, this is the definition of spinal motion restriction now. Okay. These are... 2015 the spinal protocol. Yeah, this is the protocol from the state. Exactly how to do it. You can read this stuff. It's an alternate mental status. It's very colored to me. It's like a hinder, but it's like a hinder mental. Don't even get that. Okay. Um, so, when you get that patient up from the sub basement, the construction zone, for example, we got him upstairs, put him on the stretcher. First thing is, remove the scoop, the scoop or the backboard. That goes back in your cabinet now. He doesn't, right? Lay him flat. You can lay him at 45 degrees. He's got the collar on. If you don't, if he's moving around and you don't want him to move around, you can still have somebody hold, hold it. You can even tape it to the bed. Okay, but they're on a stretcher. They're on a soft stretcher. No more transports on a, on a hard so surface. That's what they took yeah, out. Yeah, you can use it, but no transporting yeah. in it. Yeah, you don't transport for suspect the spinal injury, you go 45. Yeah. Get him out of the stretcher. Because you can. <laughs> uh, standing or ambulatory patient. So somebody's walking around and you see this massive car accident and the expensive, um, you know, uh, Porsche or whatever that, that smashed up because they were doing a thousand miles an hour. Okay. We used to do something called a standing takedown. We used to come behind them, talk to them from in front, bring the board. We used to teach this in EMT school. We may still show it to you, but you don't do it anymore. Um, so now you just say, please sit down on the bed. You do spinal motion restriction. Yeah, it's much easier. Seated patients. We used to use this device called a KED, a K-E-D, Kendrick's extrication device. We will demo it in one of the skill nights. We used to used to be tested on it by the state. It's in the book. Okay, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. There's a question on it on the lecture. Yeah. So you need to know what it is. It's a spinal immobilization device for seated patients. <coughs> okay. So we don't use that really anymore. So we need to know catch still now. Yeah, is it on the cut? 
You just said we need it, to know it. We need to know it now. Or what maybe it know it's not. There might still be questions on it, but I'll we'll get to it. Here, padding. This is very important. Listen, um, pediatric patients need sometimes to be padded because they have large heads. Okay, so you want to put a padding between the shoulders. All right, yeah. that's so that hair stays in the Either neutral one of those? position. Yes. Either one of those? Yeah. And at the hospital, you're supposed to move the patient over. Now, you see, it was easy when they were on a backboard. You could just drag half the backboard onto the hospital stretcher and then drag the other half. Now, how are you getting this spinal motion restriction patient over? So use the sheet from your bed, but you need extra manpower. Yeah. Two of you, you and your partner, it's not really going to do it. You need the hospital staff to help you move the patient over. Here, here's a transfer hint. I did that. Go down. Okay, your, oh, your stretcher you want to make higher than the hospital that's stretcher. We did that so it goes ER. down. It's easier. We did that in the ER. Yes, that's what we always do. Is that the last slide? That's it. Yeah. That's it. <clears throat> 